All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well. I'm Zach, the Events Officer of the University of Cambridge Competitive Programming Society, and I'd like to welcome you all to our first talk. Uh, we're very pleased to have Professor Stephen Skeener speaking to us today, who, among many other things, is the author of the Algorithm Design Manual and is now Director of the AI Institute at Stony Brook University. He's very kindly going to give us an hour of his time to answer your questions on competitive programming, as well as other aspects of computer science. Uh, please do ask questions in the chat at any point, and um, we'll try and pick out some of the best ones, depending on what we have time for. Uh, finally, I'd like to encourage anyone who's comfortable doing so to turn on their video, because um, we think this makes for a sort of nicer atmosphere. Um, okay, I'll hand over to Arthur now to ask some questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Zach. Uh, I'm Arthur. I'm the president of the University of Cambridge Competitive Programming Society. And yeah, I'd just like to, to echo what Zach said. Thanks so much for showing up to our first event where um, we're very lucky to have Stephen Skeener with us. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna get, jump right in with some questions for Professor Skeener, but we'd love to- Thanks a lot for inviting me. This is, uh, this is an, an interesting session. I hope, uh, uh, I, I, I appreciate the invitation and I look forward to chatting with y'all. All right, lovely, thank you, Professor. So I guess I'll jump right in with uh, the first question. So the first question being, um, to what extent do you feel that um, programming contests and algorithms courses at university uh, teach skills applicable to the real world? And I'm asking this because as I'm sure we'll uncover through these questions asked, you as someone whose work has really bridged the gap between research and industry. So to what extent do you feel that programming contests and algorithms courses teach skills applicable to the real world? So first of all, I think algorithms is a, a great subject for, um, you know, in, 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 in all kinds of different ways. I think that kind of people become computer scientists when they take algorithms courses. And I think that, um, you know, algorithms is kind of, you know, again, there's all kinds of interesting techniques and problem solving uh, methods. And it's kind of this power that comes from algorithm design where seemingly um, a bunch of people can be stumped on how, what the right way to do something is. And suddenly one guy has an insight and flash, suddenly the problem is solved. And so there's kind of this feeling of power you get from this that I think is, is good. And so I think, you know, everybody who wants to call themselves a computer scientist should um, learn algorithm design. And anyone who can, wants to consider themselves a real hotshot should try to get very good at it. And that's where I think the uh, competitive programming stuff is, is very interesting. So um, I, again, I've gotten interested in competitive programming partially because I was the coach for, of our programming uh, team for many years. And uh, I wrote a book on, uh, which many of you have seen or may have seen, called Programming ja Challenges, which is designed to teach people how to do well in programming contests. And the, you know, kind of, so I think that Programming contests are great things. The problems that come up on these programming contests, I find it is love to, it is, it is, I love to sit down and think my way through these kind of problems. Um, you know, and that was one of the fun things about coaching my teams. Um, one thing that uh, I will say is that there is a, well, I don't know if you can ask me this later. You were, you at one point uncovered an interview of mine that I had many years ago. When I was invited down to the top coder uh, world finals. How many of you have ever heard of Top Coder? Are there any people who are familiar with Top Coder? This is one of the many semi commercial, commercial ish uh, programming contests that get held. You know, you guys are familiar with Google Code Jam. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that I, I was asked to speak to the, the people right before they did the finals. And what I talked to them about was, of course, how it's great to learn about algorithms. And I think that there's great things to do. There are limitations to the skills that you get from programming contests. You know, most of the world's um, applications, algorithms are a, kind of a small part of it. And um, they're an important part of it. And kind of recognizing when you have an algorithm problem is kind of a bigger skill that sometimes isn't really taught by programming contests. I mean, in some sense, you guys are learning how to write, um, you know, if, you know uh, Route to, you know, given a, a particular well-defined problem, find an algorithm for it. 
there's a converse skill that's probably more important in industry, which is when something walks in the door, when there's some kind of problem that comes in, um, you know, to recognize that, okay, there is an abstraction of this. This can be thought of as a shortest path problem. If it's sort of, sort of a, this can be the graph that we care about. And if we do a shortest path on this, we're going to get something that we want. And these kind of things aren't really taught in programming contests and writing big systems and how big systems relate to computer science isn't something thought by programming contests. By definition, your programming contest problems are things that you're supposed to kill in an hour or less. And um, there's a different mindset there. That said, I think programming contests are a great thing for undergraduates to, to get involved with and get excited about with it about don't obsess with it to the point of making this your life but i do think that it's a fun <laughs> thing to uh to do and i you know i encourage people to play around with it i like i like being involved with the programming teams and uh you know so these problems are good things that's very interesting to hear your experience with coaching and to what extent that your coaching was then useful for people's uh, application of commercial programming in the real world. Thanks so much for the answer. So please do put in the chat here or on Facebook if you have any further questions. But uh, we just want to hear more from Professor Skeener. So yeah, I was going to ask next. So could you talk about your experience designing a prototype for the iPad? And did Apple ever formally credit you for the work you did on designing a prototype for the iPad? Could you tell us about that? Okay, so one other, let's say, passage uh, in my, my history was when I was a student, actually, uh, it was in graduate school, but when I was a student, Apple had a computer, had a contest to design the computer of the year 2000. Again, today it would be a lot easier to design the computer of the year 2000 because that was 20 years ago, but this contest was in 1988. So the goal was to try to predict what was technology going to be 12 years from now. And um, this was a team effort. And uh, we got together a team of, of students and faculty, one of whom was a fellow named Stephen Wolfram, who some of you may know, another British chap who uh, you know, went on to develop Mathematica and a lot of different things. Um, but anyway, so, it was, so we thought about what the computer, you know, we looked at technology trends and we thought about what the, uh, you know, what was going to happen in the world. And we had this idea that wouldn't it be great if we had a computer that was, say, the size of about a notepad and that you could write on it and that it would, um, what you call it, be able to communicate somehow with other things. Remember, this was before um, Bluetooth. This was before Wi-Fi. This was before, in some sense, the web, okay? And we started thinking about what technology trends were there that, uh, you know, in what you could, you know, what you could go. And we came with the conclusion that you wanted something you could write a, a tablet, you could write on with some kind of a stylus uh, that would communicate with other things that would. And then, you know, we, we won the contest. It was kind of exciting. I went to Apple. We went to Apple as the, the winners. We got to meet Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, the founders of Apple, and a lot of other people. It was kind of a cool thing. But then when the Apple iPad came out 20, you know, in 2010, people sort of recognized, my God, that was exactly what the essay that these guys wrote that actually we, 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 that appeared in the communications of the ACM, if you want to look that up. You can see what it was. So it was an interesting thing of trying to, um, you know, try to extrapolate to the future what people were trying to, you know, would want and what technologies they would be. And we happened to have guessed, you know, astonishingly right about what people wanted. We were off on the time frame. We thought that the technology would be available 10 years earlier than it was. But, um, you know, but that's something that I guess, I guess if I'm talking to a bunch of bright, you know, bright students, this is another thing I kind of encourage is that people try to think about, you know, kind of get involved in some maybe more speculative things that are outside of just programming. Programming contests are great. No, don't, don't let me diss the programming contest. <laughs> but if you have opportunities to get involved into broader areas of computer science, I think that's, that's, that's also a great thing, be it research, be it speculation, be it 
you know, trying to do something entrepreneurial. I think those are wonderful things too. Well, no, that was very impressive hearing about just how close what you had designed was to the true iPad when it came out. No, thank you for telling that story. We now have an audience question. So thanks very much to Andrew, who asks, how could an engineering student who is relatively intermediate in programming start getting involved in competitive programming? So what do you have to say on oh, that, Professor? So what I, what I will say is that I think the competitive programming is worth doing even if you're not very good at it, okay? And I think that kind of, you know, there is this, this thing called a learning curve which is that there's the question of how much do you learn a value as a function of time, okay? And I guess if I was going to draw a, a picture of this, what I would imagine is that uh, in any kind of a, um, let me see if I can do this where so you guys can see this thing. In any kind of an interesting um, area, Typically, it is easier to learn things of value early on than it is over time. Meaning, I guess, that the more and more you know, the harder and harder it is to teach you something else that's interesting or important. So that's an argument that um, if you wanted to, uh, you know, I, I encourage people who are engineers, people who are not necessarily people who did, you know, Math, math Olympiads or things like that when they were younger, um, to try some of these ACM kind of style competitions, to try some of these programming contest problems, and just play around with them. Um, you know, the uh, I think that, again, people, well, there are a couple of reasons for doing this. One, the more mercenary reason. Is a lot of pro companies. If you want to get a job as a pro, you know, in soft as a software engineer after you graduate, a lot of companies use these kind of programming contest problems as a screening to kind of rule out the people who are, you know, completely incompetent. And a little bit of experience working at one of the, you know, robot judges, something like Hacker Rank or something like Spodge or something like. Um, uh, leak code, okay? These are kind of uh, online websites. These are websites where you can go and enter, you know, they, they will give you programming contest kind of problems. You can type in your code and uh, test it and see what happens. Getting some practice on this is good for anybody, especially if you're going to eventually interview. And getting, spending some time to try to get better at this is I think a good idea. I think it helps give you a perspective on algorithms and something, you know, and work like that. I recommend trying to start with easy problems, okay, so you don't get too discouraged. And, you know, keep, you know, keep going to whatever your level of ability is. Um, eventually, you're going to want to get, take some kind of a course on algorithms or algorithmic thinking, because many of the interesting problems are not just straightforward coding, but involves some algorithmic thinking. Again, I, I, I happen to like my programming challenges book or my, uh, of course, I was introduced from my algorithm design manual. If you want my complete set of products, these are what I recommend. <laughs> okay. Any questions or comments about that? We have another question, actually, yeah, from the audience. So from my colo who asks, how close are problems presented in websites like Leet Code similar to competitive programming. So what are some key differences? And he says he sees the cracking the coding interview in the background. So is that more of the Skeena line of products? Okay, this cracking the code, that's funny that you have it on there. That I shouldn't be advertising. That, that, <laughs> that actually, it's funny, actually. I'll admit I read that, I, I got that recently because some people said, again, my book on the algorithm design manual is very, very popular for interview preparation. And someone said, oh, that's like the cracking the code book. So I took a look at the crack in the code book. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not that. That. I'm not uh, that interested in the crack in the code book. I think it's better to learn a subject um, uh, from uh, you know from from its foundations. And algorithm design is a subject worth learning. And I think my book does teach you know general algorithm design rather than what are the most important problems that people tend to ask on interviews. Okay, so there's a role for both books, but. But no, okay, well, I will hide that book then because uh, <laughs> I don't, you know, it, it, it's, 
again, that's more of a, uh, you know, cookbook kind of manual where I think that it's important to get some algorithm design principles in your head. And that's, uh, that's kind of what would come from mine. So the question was about where is it, how does it that the lead code things are different than competitive programming? What I would guess is that the lead code people and these other websites tend to plagiarize problems wherever they can find them. <laughs> and um, a lot of the places where you would find them would be the original ACM kind of websites. Again, the my, my, my personal, personal favorite of all of these is the U, UVA judge. Again, my co-author on my programming uh, the challenges book was the late Miguel Rivera. Um, and he ran a, and, and his son still runs, a website uh, called the UVA, uh, it's not called the UVA judge now, but um, if you uh, Google it, you'll, you'll have no trouble finding it. Um, the, uh, if you go, or go to programmingchallenges.com, there should be a pointer to where it currently is. But um, these things collected thousands of programming problems from um, different, appearing on different programming contests. And my guess is that uh, a lot of the lead code problems probably, uh, you know, kind of plagiar you know, I won't plagiarize, steal the problems from there. Um, now, what I would, what I would say is, there's probably also a difference of level. Now, I think everybody should do some kind of competitive programming and somebody, everybody should do a little bit of this. There's, there are different answers of what you should study and how close they are. When you're talking about um, someone trying to make their college programming theme and trying to just get started versus one of the gods that are going to be placing in the world finals as one of the top championship themes. The, the world final problems are probably harder on average than the lead code problems. If you think about it, the lead code problems and the uh, Things that things like Akarank are large, somewhat designed to screen people for interviews. Okay, the absolute people who are really the best at these things, um, you know, those problems tend to be harder. And so, I would recommend that you should, you know, I think that doing leak go problems is a great thing until you find them maybe too easy, and maybe you want ones that have more math or more of a trick in it, more of an algorithmic trick in it. And then I would probably recommend looking more at the ACM uh, ICPC problems. These are available online. Um, and, you know, there's regional problems, and then there's the world final problems. The world final problems probably tend to be harder. So start with the regionals. And, uh, you know, those, those, I think, are probably the next level of, of, of complexity up. Okay? But I do think the leak code problems are are good, especially for beginners. Nice. So good, good problems, but perhaps, perhaps partly plagiarized. That was very impressive to give us such a training ladder about which problems to, to do at which level. So thank you, Professor. So we have another audience question. So Andre now asks, is this is, he says, an opinion that he says online more and more nowadays is that leak code problems have nothing to do with what a software engineer does day to day. So do you agree or disagree that leak code and kind of interview-based okay. problems so this is a little bit like, again, what I came in telling you about. I think that doing programming contests is a great thing. I think that becoming an algorithmic thinker is a great thing. I think that many of you who I gather, some of you are uh, Olympiad level, um, you know, people in maybe the IOI or the, ma uh, the Math Olympiad. Um, you know, I think that for being a, you know, you know, a scholar who should be someone who goes to grad school in these kind of, I think these are great things because really learning how to do these things is valuable and useful. That said, does the average software engineer sit around and design algorithms all the, every day, all day? The answer is no. Most of what they do is understanding specifications. They're doing, they're wrestling bigger pieces of code. Um, and I think that, um, so there is a, a, a break between a, uh, you know, what I will say, a, um, you know, a, a good contest programmer and a good software engineer. And anyone who, you know, uh, you know, I would, if I were, I, I did at one point have a startup. When I had a startup, you know, with people would I hire, 
I did not go out of my way to hire, you know, um, people who were great at the algorithmic, at, you know, the programming contest problems. I went out of my way to hire people who were good at wrangling systems, who had some experience with this kind of thing. So I think algorithmics, algorithmics is very good to tell how, how well you can think and to train you to think better and to convince other people that you're very smart, which is a, a useful thing, because I think being smart does give you the ability to solve problems. But a lot of what is software development involves different sets of skills. And that's why I encourage people to get broad backgrounds rather than to overly specify in any, specialize in any one thing. No, so thanks very much for, for that answer. We should spread our wings far. Thanks very much, Professor. Well, again, some people complain. Again, the people who complain about the leap codes sometimes are uh, it's because the leap code things and, and these kind of screening questions that companies do. You can't get an interview till you pass the screening thing. So there is a minimum level of algorithmic level of programming and, and, and problem solving that you need to be able to do before a good company will even talk to you, okay? And so you better at least have that level. But, um, but no, obviously the people who are really sharp and quick, which is what algorithmic design and it you know, gives you that kind of experience, have a leg up in other things. But there are also other skills that are important in being a big software, a good software engineer. Great, thanks for the question. So yeah, if everyone, if you want to keep posting questions, please do but I have some more to keep us going. So in the book, which uh, you've already shown to us, and I can see right now, so that's the algorithm design manual. You included lots of uh, war stories in that book. And you said these provide a better perspective on how algorithms problems arise in the real world. You included the war stories as tales of our experience with real problems. So what made you add these to the book? And what do they add to the experience of learning algorithms? What do you have to say about that? So, so there's a qu the question is about what, to a certain extent, I'm going to interpret the question is what's different about my algorithm book than in other algorithm books. So, you know, the main, th there exist many other good algorithm books, okay? And I guess the most famous one is this big white MIT, Corman, Leisterton, Rivest, and Stein book, okay? That I trust. How many of you have seen that book? The big MIT book? Yeah, everybody's seen that. And that's, that's if you want a deep graduate level understanding of, of uh, you know, algorithm design, that is the right book for you. Now, on the other hand, um, I think that someone, look, you know, most students looking at that book often fail to see sort of the forest for the trees in certain levels. I mean, it's a very, it's a very big book. It's a very formal book. It covers a lot of different things with a, a, a fair amount of depth. There's not very much intuition, I think, though, provided by that book. I mean, so, or, 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 there's, or my students don't kind of often get the intuition from reading that kind of book. And so my goal with the algorithm book was to try to produce a book that was going to teach algorithm design while being accessible to a bigger audience than would be able to handle something like the uh, MIT book. Um, I resolved that I was going to have no theorems and no proofs in this book, okay? Which, of course, when you look at it, the MIT book, you get scared by all the theorems and proofs. Um, but I do have a, kind of the arguments, the intuition as to why al certain algorithms are correct, why they are fast, how you would design these kind of things. So my goal was to try to produce intuition. And one way that I, uh, to kind of give some intuition about what's important, I went through which of my, um, what you call it, which of my, over the years I've been lucky in that I've gotten to work on a bunch of different problems, uh, research problems with people from different fields like biology and uh, social science and electrical engineering and things like that. And I've uh, encountered a lot of different problems in my life where somebody came in the door and you know, said, oh, I don't know how to come up with this algorithm. Okay, and those stories are kind of designed to um, what you call it to tell uh, kind of how did I go from this raw application till the point where we could isolate what was really the algorithm problem underneath it, and then kind of what happened about it. So that's kind of why I have the war stories, and a lot of people have them as fun to read. 
you know, one thing that's true about war stories is every time you tell them, they get a little bit better, okay? But I still think that they kind of try to capture the truth of what the encounter was and what the uh, re reason, re you know, what the, the story was there. Um, so that's what the, the stories are about. And, um, you know, like once I got, got called by a company that um, claimed to make software for predicting, teaching people to predict what lottery numbers were going to come in, okay? <laughs> that they were going to teach you to sort of use your mind and predict what lottery numbers were likely to come in. And they then wanted to know, well, what would be the tickets we should buy once we, our psychic has figured out what lottery numbers are going to come in? And that turns out to be a, you know, a, a, an, an algorithmic problem, a very combinatorial problem to try to find out what is the minimum number of tickets, you know, to satisfy certain kinds of constraints. And there were lessons and stories that happened there. And that's the kind of thing that I want to report about. Okay, and some people enjoy reading. Many people report that they enjoy reading that kind of stuff and find it somewhat inspiring. So that's what that's why I got war stories. No, that's yeah, and it's exciting not just to read it but to hear it as well. So thanks for that. Now, uh, uh, Thomas asks: So, how do you see the field of computer science, uh, particularly from a machine learning, which we haven't touched much on yet, and algorithms perspective, advancing biology and medicine in the next few decades? So one of the things again, I'm now you know I, you know a a quite senior faculty member. So I've been teaching at Stony Brook for over thirty years now, and it's been interesting watching computer science to change and develop over the years. You know that uh, again, when I started working as a computer science professor, this was before there was an internet. This was at before at the time when people were laughing at machine learning. Okay, there was had been history. If you follow the history of AI and machine learning. There were periods when they were saying they were going to take over the world. Then, then people realized they had nothing, and everyone laughed at AI for a few years till they tried again. And you know, certainly over the last fifteen years, no one is laughing anymore. Somehow, that the machine learning has matured to a point that it really is a uh, kind of amazing technology, and can do uh, kinds of you know some, some pretty amazing things. And um, so certainly a part of machine learning, a part of any, uh, a, a part of any mo you know, modern computer science education, one should definitely take a couple of classes in machine learning and one should understand, you know, understand this stuff because this is kind of an important thing. Um, one thing that's also true because the world goes up and down and up and down and up and down. It would not shock me if there was a point five years from now where machine learning technologies kind of start to hit a wall. That they, you know, kind of it's been the case that people seem to build these bigger and bigger models and they keep seeming to get better and better. Okay. And this has been happening. There's no law that says this is going to always happen. Um, so I would not surprise if be surprised if at some point there is a a, a world where um, machine learning technology saturates and other te technologies maybe that are more problem specific things that more involve more algorithmic reasoning uh, become more important. So I think everybody should be involved with machine learning these days on at least some level. Um, I don't think it's exclusive. I think you should have a a broad background in computer science, but machine learning is important. And, you know, it clear, it's clear that for a lot of pattern recognition problems, whenever you want to classify something or predict something, machine learning models are a, long, a large part of the way to, you know, the, the right way to do that these days. And that was probably less true 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, but it, 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 I find it kind of hard to predict where exactly the, the AI and machine learning revolution will end up. Back in the days when I was doing the iPad, inventing the iPad, I thought I had a good crystal ball to predict the future. I feel my crystal ball is less good these days. The world seems to move faster and um, in, in some ways that are maybe a little bit less predictable. So, uh, so it's clear machine learning is important. It's going to be important in medicine and biology and all kinds of things. But uh, and and you guys will will be some of the people to figure out and make it make that happen. 
thanks for the answer. That was a, I like the part in the crystal ball too. So thank you so much for that. And again, if all of you want to know what I really think about machine learning and stuff, I do teach a data science class um, that uh, is, you know, data science is kind of, I think of as applied machine learning, not, not theoretical machine learning, but applied machine learning. And um, I teach this, I teach an algorithms course and I teach a data science class and I came up with a textbook for this that covers what I think is kind of the important part about getting started in machine learning. So just like there are programming contest problems in their algorithmics, the kind of leak code and ACM and this kind of stuff, there is this area called Kegel. How many people are familiar with Kegel? K-A-G-G-L-E. These are kind of a contest site around um, what you call it, around building machine learning or applied uh, data science kind of models. And uh, that's also a, a, a useful thing to be able to do. Okay, we can move Thank on. You. Here we have, thank you everyone for all the audience questions. This is really going well. So now Yuri asked that from your Wikipedia page, um, you've worked on synthetic virus design for use in vaccines. Could you talk about that work? Because it sounds very interesting to us all. So this is this is something that again, you know, one of one of the um, good things about being working in algorithms and looking for pro you know again, algorithmic thinking is largely about where is there a problem? Can you come up with a, a problem that is worth? thinking about it. I think algorithm people tend to be good about uh, coming up with problems. And maybe this is something that is an important part of research, just trying to find what is an interesting problem to be working on. Um, one thing that we worked on for many years, and we still have a little bit of, I, we still dabble in, is um, was an observation we had about um, genetics that uh, some of you, I'm sure many, many of you have taking a biology course, you know DNA codes for proteins. Um, you may remember that there is kind of a, a table that's in a, a coding table that is inherent in um, the human genome. And I'm not going to be able to come up with a, well, maybe this figure is wrong. Let me just take a look at it. Many of you know that DNA sequences are some pattern on uh, A, C, G, and T. Okay, this much you guys have probably seen. Um, the reason why um, we care about DNA is DNA contains sort of a descriptions of all the proteins, the components that make up, you know, your body. And the way that DNA is read as proteins is that there is a coding table that somehow cells have figured out, okay, that takes triples of DNA and maps them to the components of proteins, which are called amino acids. So what's interesting? DNA is a, a four-letter alphabet, A, C, G, and T. Um, proteins are made out of 20 different amino acids, okay? Why do we have triples of DNA encoding proteins, encoding amino acids? Well, four to the third is 64. So if you have 64 triples, you have enough triples that you can specify 20 different amino acids. Does everybody kind of see that? So you can imagine, so there's kind of this cellular language that maps triples of DNA to amino acids. And in fact, it does it within a uh, redundant way. So all 64 of those triples of, of letters mean something. Um, so different amino acids can be encoded. Sometimes there's only one triple for it. Sometimes there's many as six of them. And if you follow this, what it means is that there's many different ways to code for any given protein. If there are 16 different, six different ways of coding for leucine, you could imagine six different possibilities okay, at, at, at one position in a gene. If you have leucine followed by another leucine, you've got 60, 36 possible ways of encoding that gene. And in general, if you have a protein of length n, on average, you have about three to the n different ways 
you could have written a DNA sequence that will describe that protein. Nature picked one of them. There's evolution. Nature picked one of them. And in some sense, if you believe in, well, evolution and optimization, nature was presumably trying to pick one that was going to be best, the encoding that was best for the organism. How did we, but, but this, if you think about it, gives an algorithm problem. If there are three to the N different um, genes that are possible to code for any protein, and if you have some specification, an algorithmic condition of what you deem best, can you write an algorithm to design, find which is the best of these three to the N encodings? You don't want to go through all three to the N because three to the N is a big number. But you can imagine now that there's an algorithm problem here. I think hopefully some of you have kind of got a whiff of that, okay? That if I give you a criteria for what is best, there's now an algorithm problem designed the best gene for a given protein. And when we, we started this, I started playing with, we developed algorithms for various notions of what best meant. And then I started talking to a virologist here at Stony Brook um, who had actually gotten famous because he had synthesized the first life form. Okay. He had, you know, built a, a from, from, from a test tube, built a, a DNA sequence of a variant of polio virus, and then booted it up to life. And so in some sense could create, just from the database sequence in a, um, on, on a computer, create a new virus. And then based on this, I said, well, why don't we see if we can design the best virus? Okay, and what does best mean? Well, if we wanted a vaccine, we wanted a, a virus with the property that, um, okay, we got, no, COVID is coming out now, okay? We know that you can get in, uh, everybody's familiar with COVID now. Everybody is probably familiar with um, the fact that once you're infected by it, if you survive it, okay, you will be immune to it or presumably immune to it from then on. So one way I could protect you is to inject you with a shot of live COVID vaccine virus. Would this be a good thing or a bad thing? Who's volunteering to get a shot of live COVID vaccine? Probably not. But what if I could design a COVID vaccine with the prop a COVID virus with the property that the genes were encoded, not so they would be the best possible way to code for this gene protein. But what if I designed it so that it was the worst possible way for coding for this protein? Presumably, this would hurt the organism, okay? And what you would hope to get is a, vi a version of the COVID virus that was weak but still alive. The proteins are what make it do what it does. So you need to get all the proteins the same if it's going to really be that virus. But if you code it for it in a way that is probably going to weaken it, okay, this might create a weakened version of COVID that your body would be able to fight off reliably. And this you would take a live shot of, okay? And so this is basically how we, what we did with the um, synthetic virus design, okay? We had algorithms that would design weakened versions uh, we did this with polio, we did this with flu. Design weakened versions of polio and flu. We would then synthesize the molecule. You could go and send our design and a check off to a company and they'll mail you back the DNA to your specification. My collaborators would boot this DNA to life, okay, to create live viruses. And then they would um, test it and what we found was that our weakened viruses had the property that, yes, they were weak and your body could fight them off pretty easily, but they still protected in, for example, we did the experiments in mice. They would still protect mice then against a challenge from the, the what would have been a lethal dose of the original agent if they didn't have it. So that was an example of a problem where, um, you know, where they're, Lurking it was not a very, very complicated algorithm design. You know, you can think of this as a dynamic programming problem or something like this, once you have the right conditions. 
But specifying this and realizing and communicating to the right person is what kind of makes it an interesting thing. So that's that's what I had to say about vi viruses. Wow. Any Thank questions you. about viruses or anything like that? Yeah, I'm certainly going to ask something more on that later if no one else puts something in chat, because I'm fascinated by that explanation of biology for competitive programmers, taking it from the string level. That was really interesting. But now Ray asks, he was wondering, how do you suggest someone strikes the balance between tackling competitive programming problems and doing other things which make someone a better and hireable software engineer? So coming right back to what you've been saying before about right. spreading. Well, you know, again, so, so first, that's funny. I don't, you know, I don't know exactly how the um, British, let's say, or, uh, you know, let's say educational system differs from the United States. So I'm used to teaching at a, 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 a university in the United States. I'm used to, for example, we have a four-year undergraduate program. You guys, I gather, have three years. Am I right? In general, I think most people here will be doing three years. Okay, and uh, you probably specialize more. Again, I don't know. It's a little bit, you know, so, so, so to what extent I, I, I can uh, generalize, we'll, we'll have to see. But, um, you know, again, I do believe that there is a learning curve, and I do believe in breadth, and I do believe that it's worth getting to a point where um, but you should keep doing, I think, doing the programming contest stuff. I encourage you to do it for fun, okay, and while you're making progress, okay, and that that's kind of the level that, and, and when progress starts getting to be hard, okay, I probably recommend jumping off, okay, that uh, maybe if you want to win the world programming contest, okay, then you got to keep beating on it. But ultimately, the question of whether you can implement Dijkstra's algorithm in 12 minutes or six minutes is ultimately not, a, not that important a thing. Being able to implement it in an hour, okay, or two hours is a good thing, okay? And then, you know, recognizing, other, you know, recognizing what other kind of problems you're dealing with. So, again, you know, I, I encourage people to try to have broad interest. And I don't know, how do you get broad interest? I encourage people to read the newspaper. I trust you guys, you know, many of you guys do that. Um, and, you know, actually, how much of a choice do you guys have about what things you take as undergraduates? Maybe I'm now going to ask this thing. In a world like, you know, obviously you're going to a great university. How many of you are computer science majors? Do I see people who are computer science majors, or are you majoring in different things? I'm only seeing one person switch. You can see a hand, yeah. Wait, what are the rest of you doing? There's certainly, computer oh, yeah, there's another thumb. There are a few. people switch. What are the rest of, rest of you people doing? I think uh, if I ask for hands for people who do maths, there will be a few. Anyone so if you're math? doing maths, what I would say is, if again, if you're going to go in and become a math PhD and become a math professor, you don't need any of this stuff. On the other hand, if you are going to be someone who is studying math and wanting to get interested in, again, math is a perfectly good preparation for things, especially machine learning involves a lot more continuous math, for example, than uh, computer scientists traditionally learn. Um, you know, I do recommend that um, people get experience. If you're taking math, it may be that you're not going to take any software engineering. I mean, do you take you get chances to choices to take software engineering classes? From a maths background, that's quite unlikely in the UK. It's more specific than in America. Okay. So one thing that I encourage, I mean, again, math puzzle problems, you guys are used to solving Olympiad problems or Putnam problems or whatever other kinds of things you guys are used to. Um, and the programming contest problems map to those pretty well. You know, I do encourage you to write some kind of what I will say applications level programming. And I don't know to what extent people um, do that naturally. If you're not going to be taking courses in it, it's important to be doing what I would say some level of application programming. Um, I don't know quite what that means to different people, but it, it should be something related to your interest. When I was a student, um, one thing that got me interested in computer science was I wrote a program to predict the results of football games, American football games, okay? And, uh, you know, that's not a programming contest problem. 
that is a you know programming kind of problem and there's some kind of data analysis problem and that's kind of a applied thing a little bit and i would probably say that it's it's good if you're interested in computing and you are a math person to find some kind of a applications level program that you're interested in building related to something of your interest okay maybe it's an app on a phone maybe it's an analysis program for something bigger that you're thinking about but i do think that there are skills that come from you know software development that are kind of important if you're going to work in this kind of an area and um you know uh, i don't doubt that you're bright enough to pick this stuff up but i do think that it takes experience and it takes a a a certain taste for it that i encourage you to develop thank you i think we've had two questions now on the biology which i was also fascinated by so you and asks first of all what are the best on ramps for bioinformatics coming from an algorithm design or competitive programming backgrounds so what's the best way to get into bioinformatics from competitive programming bioinformatics is again when i first got into bioinformatics it was the time of the uh what you it was the time of the human genome project and this was when you know it was, everything was new and everything was exciting and uh you know as time goes by things get more and more specialized so in the beginning you know the 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 bio, the, the average biologist was highly suspicious of computing okay and uh was someone who mucked around in a lab and and did things like boot up my viruses and things like that in test tubes and things um now there has emerged a class of people who are doing um you know bio who who are trained bioinformatics people i will say any of your friends who are studying biology or molecular micro you know microbiology molecular biology or something like this certainly they should be doing bioinformatics now they should be able to program in python and they should be able to do some of these kind of tools i will say the problems in in bioinformatics in general these days are more i will say mess i would say biology oriented than computing infrastructure oriented in general so it's an area that uh i find you, now you need to know more biology and possibly less computer science than you used to in order to to work in this area and um so so i guess i would say is if you're interested in this you should be interested in in molecular biology and um you know and uh, presumably there's lots of different ways of uh of uh, getting involved with this i read a book called by uh, james watson who was one of the founders you know discoverers of dna called molecular i think it was called molecular biology of the cell or something like this and so that that gives you some kind of a picture of what's going on but um but it, but it's something that again i would say that if you're interested in bioinformatics these days you you have to learn 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 a fair amount of biology to be able to contribute in a meaningful way uh -huh. so on that note of learning some more biology it's a question that i'm really interested in too yes so daniel asks that how do differences in dna bases express themselves if the protein ends up being the same so what is it you're optimizing when you have those several ways okay so that's now a, that's now a good question so um <laughs> what it amounts to is the following so let's let's think about it so you're right that all of these code encodings are i guess um logically the same they will all express the same dna you know the, the the dna all these encodings will ultimately express the same sequence of amino acids which is the protein now recognize that this copying process that goes from um the uh you know from the dna to the rna this is all being implemented chemically there's all these you know there's these molecules called transfer rnas that are 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 binding with things there's a ribosome that's going through and assembling this protein there's a lot of copying operation here that is evolved that is complicated now what does it mean to optimize the genome okay for what you're dealing with well one thing that that is true is that certain organisms let's say there's six different ways of using uh encoding the amino acid acid leucine 
maybe you're trying to make a virus that's going into people. Um, if you look, do a database study of all the genes that are, are in the human genome, one thing you may be interested to observe is that one of these six is used far more often than others, okay? The usage in real genes, okay, is not necessarily uniform. Now, why is that? Well, presumably the cellular machinery has evolved the reason why it likes some of these triplets better than others, even though they are logically synonymous. Maybe it's because the molecule, the transferrin-A that binds at this point, binds more strongly than, some, uh, than, the, than the competitors, okay? So the simplest idea of optimization might be, if I want to get a gene that's going to make lots of copies, I'm probably better off putting the most popular of these triplets in instead of the less popular of these tri triplets. That's a simple optimization criteria that I think everyone can understand. And if I wanted to produce a vaccine, maybe something that's going to be, you know, maybe crippled, maybe I should put the least popular triplet in. Okay, so that's a simple form of optimization that I think everyone can understand. In fact, with the, vac the vaccine work, we did a, a something a little bit more subtle. If you look at the genomes that, uh, in, in, in the database, and you count how often pairs of, of triples occur next to each other in genes. You can compute which pairs of triples are overrepresented or underrepresented relative to the codon distribution, the triplet distribution, and the amino acid distribution. And it turns out that certain pairs of triples don't like to be next to each other. For some reason, the cellular machinery doesn't seem to like it as much as other pairs of triples. So our real optimization came in. How do we use reasonably popular codons for a particular organism, okay, avoiding the unpopular ones, while also trying to get the advantage of the pairs, okay, so that the adjacencies between these are popular, okay? And recognizing that there are these codon biases and these codon pair biases, maybe that should convince you that although they are logically similar, okay, they can tr translate at different speeds and, and, and that makes a difference. Um, and so, so, uh, so by looking at what evolution has avoided, if we want to create something weak, we should put in what evolution has avoided. If we want to make something strong, we should put in what evolution has kind of favored. And that's kind of what our, uh, our vision on this is. Thanks for explaining what exactly we're optimizing there. That was very good to hear. So what I wanted to ask you now uh, is we'd love some more questions from the chat. We've heard all about these projects you've completed in the past. What are you currently working on? So these days, these days, you know, um, again, I have, you know, I do my work through P with PhD students mostly. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of stuff, my PhD students are kind of, we work mostly in what I would call data science applied machine learning these days, you know, is what kind of my, my honest research is in these days. And um, they're kind of two different directions that we work, I work, in, my, my group works in. One is about representing um, knowledge from information from networks so they can be put into machine learning models. So, you know, many of you, uh, okay, I'm going to go out, go on a limb and say many of you are on Facebook or Instagram, okay, or some other social network. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, um, one of the things that, that, that these kind of companies want to do is they want to be able to, you know, when you have a network, you're a node in this network. And um, Facebook or Instagram would like to be able to build machine learnings that will make predictions about you. What ads are you going to be interested in? Okay. It would be interesting if we could take the network and boil it down into something that will construct a short feature vector for each person 
so that it encodes the information in the network. I mean, recognize that your friends in the network tell you tell a lot about you. My guess is, if you if you guys are all friends, what is it telling you? I can look at Arthur and I can say, well, Arthur's friends are almost certainly people who are uh, smart people who are probably in math, probably at Cambridge or similarly good schools. Okay, um, probably not people who are sixty years old. Probably young people. Okay. All of this is probably encoded in their network of friends. Is there a way we can take that, in some sense, the network, this N by N mate adjacency matrix of a graph, and encode it as a short vector, okay? Such a vector of numbers. Vectors of numbers are good inputs to machine learning problems, okay? To machine learning systems, if you want to do linear regression or anything else like that. Can we find short vector representations of everybody's neighborhood in a big graph, such that it encodes a lot of information about them. And this is something that we've done. We have a popular technique for doing this called deep walk. And I'm interested in ways of rep finding these graph embeddings. That's one of the things that we work on. Um, another part of me is interested in natural language processing. Again, one of the thing that these, uh, one of the um, things that have changed with machine learning pretty wildly is how natural language processing systems work. Things that, you know, maybe try to identify, you know, the people, places, and things in, in, a, in a piece of text. Um, now it's all based on machine learning. At one point it was based on linguistics and rules and stuff like that. But now it's based on machine learning. I'm interested, my, my, my students work on problems of trying to analyze text in some way. Um, Right now, I've got a couple students trying to look at, we have a corpus of about 100,000 novels, you know, fictional stories people wrote. And we're trying to look at these novels and try to see what we can learn computationally by reading novels. Novels tell you a lot about what's inside people's heads. If you wanted to try to build a, a computational model of how people think, you probably would get, in some sense, novels are supposed to say what's kind of inside, you know, what are people's concerns are, what are people's thoughts. And maybe by looking at novels and trying to understand stories and trying to understand these things, we can learn, le learn things about that that are interesting. So I'm interested in kind of, at this point, I have one, one group of students working on natural language processing of large text like novels, and another group of students interested in um, you know, machine learning kind of things based on embeddings. Right, thank you. I think we have time for about one more question. I just wanted to bring back, we've come a long way, especially with the discussion into biology and now machine learning, to bring back to the kind of software engineering questions we were asking to begin with. So you mentioned that these competitive programming problems are hurdles for coding interviews. Do you, do you approve of that system? Do you think that's a good system to vet people for uh, programming jobs? Or is oh, it more cynical about that? I am of two minds on this. First of all, I think that coding interviews are a great way to vet people for interviews because people have to buy my book to prepare for it. <laughs> and I've sold an awful lot of books to people who are preparing for interviews. And of course, these people have learned about algorithms, and that's a good thing. So there's all kinds of good things that have happened in the world because of this. Um, that said, when I, I will confess one thing. When I had my startup company, um, I had a startup company called General Sentiment. In fact, here I have my uh, official General Sentiment team uh, mug. Um, the, you know, we interviewed software developers for, uh, you know, for, you know, for doing this. And whenever these developers came in to me to be interviewed, they were always afraid they were going to get all these puzzle problems. And I never asked any of them a single algorithm question. Um, I was interested in things like, what kind of things had you built before? What, what, what is the, one question I always ask people is, what is the biggest program you ever built? What did it do? Okay, um, and why was it interesting? These are kind of questions that I think get, give me something about the complexity of what kind of thing you can build. You know, uh, what kind of things are you interested in? What kind of skills do you have? So, um, you know, there, there's, there's a need for, you know, and, and, you know, 
I, I usually feel in the course of discussions about this, I get ideas about the sophistication of their thinking, including about algorithmic problems. You know, one thing we will often drill down, once I know what you built, what was the algorithmic challenge of interest in what you were building? Okay, that's the kind of way that I personally would test these things. But fortunately for you guys, I'm not the one that's going to be interviewing you for the jobs that you're applying for. So I guess you do have to um, learn about algorithms. And, uh, you know, again, I, I, I have no doubt you guys will be good at that. But, um, you know, but, but you know, that's why, that's why I encourage, you know, people, you, you read books and you practice these kind of things. And uh, I, I'm sure you'll do well at it. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. And thanks, everyone, for coming to the talk. We certainly learned an awful lot from that. So <clears throat> I hope you get on well. And, thank you very um, much. One question, and now I have a question for you guys. Okay, again, I picture you guys as right British people. Um, I, one word I've always liked is the word boffin. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to, you know, you, how many of you guys know what a boffin is? There are people who know what boffins are. Do I qualify as a boffin? Okay, I want a little vote here. Okay. Is there a vote? Who says I'm a boffin? Who says I'm not a boffin? Okay. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, hopefully I can call myself one. And uh, anyway, good luck with what you're doing, and thanks a lot for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. Okay? No, okay. Take care. Thanks, Professor. Goodbye.